Good morning. Today I have the honour, because he's, he's a, I'm a big fan of his, of talking to Dave Golson. Uh, Dave Golson, for those that don't know, and you should do because you should read his books. Uh, Dave is a sort of author of various different books, uh, which I've got all four of them in hardback. I made sure I got them in hardback because they look better on the shelf. Um, so we've got Sting in the Tail, which starts that sort of talks generally about bees. Then it takes you to a buzz in the meadow, which actually talks more generally about uh, inverts and stunning book. We then got Bee Quest, which is obviously Dave's own quest for bees. And then we've got his latest book, which we'll be talking about, which, as you can see, I'm sort of starting to read. Uh, this is The Garden in the Jungle. Um, awesome book. So welcome, Dave. Um, might Pleasure be to be here. Hi, yeah. It might be best if you just start off, just give a little bit of background to yourself, because as I've just talked to you about beforehand, I'm not going to say Essex University because it's Sussex University, isn't it? So I'll let you introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, so, um, yeah, my day job is not writing books. It's I'm an academic. I'm a professor of biology at the University of Sussex, as you say, and I've been I've just been kind of fascinated by insects all, all my life and somehow managed to persuade someone to pay me to study them. So I, I specialise really in bumblebees, but I dabble in all sorts of other insects too. And it, I'm, I guess my real interest is, is in ensuring these things survive, you know, insects are in decline and uh, I think they're really amazing, cute creatures and uh, um, it's, it's a tragedy that they are disappearing and so my kind of self-appointed mission in life is to try and save the insects basically which uh, is a big ask but you know it's, uh, you've got to yeah. be ambitious haven't you well yeah and I, and I think um what i want to talk to you about today in particular is given the current situation that we're in um a lot of people are paying a lot more attention to the gardens so what i'd like to talk to you about is the first two chapters not not just because of the only ones i read i'm a lot further in than that um but when i was reading it the other day i thought actually yeah that, that's the two really relevant chapters for where we are today which is basically what people can do in their own gardens to help you in your quest for want of a better phrase of, of sort of protecting pollinators so i think if we start off um i just want to give people that haven't read your books or are not sort of necessarily sort of that familiar with wildlife I uh, just give a quick overview of what a pollinator is because I think when you say it's pollinators to people they think oh it's honeybees but there's much more than that so could you just give a brief introduction to sort of some of the pollinator families yeah sure so so bees are the most famous pollinators but even there, there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding. People, as you say, tend to think of honeybees, but that's just one species. There are 20,000 species of bee in the world, about 270 just in the UK. Um, and most of them, people are just completely unaware of their existence, really. Some of them are quite small and inconspicuous, but nonetheless, they're important. Um, but then bees are just kind of the tip of the pollinator iceberg. There are uh, wasps, beetles, various species of flies, butterflies, moths. Um, I've probably forgotten a couple of other insect groups. It, there was a very rough calculation that there are at least 4,000 species of pollinating insect just in the UK. And, you know, we're in a fairly depauperate little island, so nobody knows how many there are globally, but it would be possibly in excess of a million species of pollinators. Of course, we don't know how many species of insects there are in the world, so, so that would be an extremely rough guess. But there's an awful lot, basically. And yeah. it's, certainly, it's certainly not all down to honeybees. Important and lovely though they are. Yeah, too right. And uh, something like the hoverflies, uh, very misunderstood, fantastic mimics. You've got various types of hoverflies. Um, lots of species very very hard to identify but i think what people need to understand is as well that hoverflies are that just that they flies you know they, they're not going to sting you so a lot of what you see in your garden on your plants are hoverflies and if you get one in the house don't kill it because it's it's not a wasp it's not a bee uh, don't kill wasps or bees either we had a queen wasp coming to my bookshelf yesterday which was quite interesting trying to get that one out um but yeah don't kill any of them because pollinators are really important if you could just tell us dave just uh, just how important they are 
because yeah, well, that's, that's an easy thing. a bit, but let's just broaden on that. Yes, I mean, basically, flowers evolved to to attract insect pollinators, primarily insects. In South America, it might be hummingbirds, but ninety nine percent of the time, it's insects. So there wouldn't be any flowers if there weren't insect pollinators. 87% of all the plant species in the world need pollinating by some kind of animal, usually an insect. Um, so, you know, that's pretty much all of them really. We'd be left with grasses and a few conifers if, if we didn't have pollinators. Then in terms of human crops, um, roughly three quarters of the crop varieties and species that we grow in the world need pollinating by insects. Um, so, you know, without pollinators, we wouldn't have most of the fruit and veg that we kind of take for granted. You know, you go to the supermarket and there's uh, normally aisles and aisles of fruit and veg there, you know, from all over the world. Well, most of that is due to insects, you know, things like everything from apples to cherries to blueberries and raspberries and strawberries and tomatoes and chili peppers and even things like coffee and chocolate depend on pollinators. So, you know, life would be pretty dismal. And, and I mean, the, the honest truth is people, millions would starve um, if we didn't have insects. So, um, yeah, we, we need to look after these things. Yeah, I think um, the good move you made there was mentioning chocolate, because I think now <laughs> you've got lots of people's attention. Exactly. Um, coffee does it for some too. Yeah, well, coffee definitely does it for me. In fact, I need one about now. Um, yeah. I've had, I might be wrong. I've read somewhere that uh, coffee relies on just one species, uh, not coffee, sorry, chocolate relies on just one species for pollinating. Is that right? And it's, it's a funny little fly, a type of midge. So, you know, most people hate midges. They think of them as those, you know, bitey things that if you go to Scotland in summer, you just get eaten alive by midges. Well, um, the, if it weren't for midges, we wouldn't have, wouldn't have cocoa, we wouldn't have chocolate. And it's, so there's this little they're only a couple of millimetres long, little tiny flies, basically, that live in the tropics, and uh, they're the only pollinators of uh, the cocoa flower. That's amazing. It, it really is amazing. When you think about it, when you think about the, the sheer scale of sort of chocolate, and you think it's all down to a midge the size of, what, half your small fingernail or something like that? Yeah, I, the, I mean, they're, they're, yeah. with, with my uh, slightly blurry eyesight these days, I can barely see them, you know. Yeah, too right. But you can feel them when they're biting. <laughs> yeah, although the, the, the cocoa pollinating ones don't bite. Oh, um, there you go. Even more reasons. Species of midge. So, yeah, yes. they're entirely benign. Yeah. Um, right. So, moving on to gardens. Um, everybody, or a lot of people have got gardens at the moment, and everybody that has them is probably spending a lot of time in them, and probably more than usual. So let's start off by talking about plants. And what I will do at the end is when I, when I put the YouTube link up, I will link to some of your pages on the website because obviously you, you broaden on the list. But I'm going to start off asking you a question that you address in, in your book, which is native or non-native, which is best? Yeah, this is gets quite kind of heated sometimes, strangely, really. I mean, my... I think in a garden, both are fine, you know, I, it would be, I think it's a bit daft to, to try and encourage people to only grow native flowers in their gardens because it's, it's unrealistic. You know, there are so many other beautiful flowers that we're rather attached to. But generally speaking, um, native plants do tend to be a little bit better than non-natives uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One is that they've co-evolved with our pollinators, so they're some non-natives uh, are just adapted to pollination by types of insect or, or sometimes birds that we just don't have. So they're, they're fairly useless as far as providing food for pollinators is concerned. But there are plenty of non-natives which are fantastic for pollinators. Um, the other angle to this though is that if you grow native plants, they're more likely to provide food plants for things like caterpillars or butterflies and moths or different species of sap sucking bug. Um, and so when it comes to what they're uh, herbivorous insects, they tend to be much more specialist about what plants they'll visit compared to pollinators. Um, so, I mean, uh, anyone who knows anything about butterflies knows that most butterflies only have one or two host plants and they, their caterpillars just can't eat anything else. And those are always, of course, native species. So if you want to 
maximize the insect diversity in your garden, not just pollinator diversity, then growing as many native plants as you can is, is good. But, you know, don't get uptight about it and feel you have to kind of throw away all the, the exotics as well. Um, uh, you know, there are some beautiful non-natives that are also good to have in the garden. But in more, I, I guess the, the area, sorry, I'm maybe going off on a bit of a tangent here, but what I do get a little bit upset is people sell what they call wildflower seed mixes and they're full of non-natives. And that seems a bit naughty to me. You know, if you're going to call it wildflower, by, you're implying to me that it's a native. And, and yet they're often full of things like cosmos, which comes from North America, which looks pretty, but it's not a native flower and we, we should know the difference. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're right. I didn't know they did that. That's uh, that's not great. That's not great. Um, don't want to sort of dwell on it too much because we'll we'll try and sort of concentrate on the positives on this one. But I, I will talk to you again about um, sort of you know the, the chemicals and fungicides and all the rest of it involved um, in what struck me as being I was, I was quite shocked actually. I think it's your chapter three or four um, where you talk about the amount of chemicals that if you go to a garden centre and mm. buy a plant, the amount of chemicals that that particular plant is actually already soaked in um, can't be good for pollinators, can even have an impact on humans. Shocked me. Amazing piece of research. Can you just broaden a little bit on that? And we'll, I think it's definitely merits its own interview, but if you just give us a little bit of an insight now. Yeah, I, I mean, I always had this kind of sneaking suspicion that the, you know, you go to a garden centre and they, the, the flowers look amazing. Obviously, they, they, you know, they want you to start to buy them. So they're, it's in their interest to, to have the plants looking in peak condition. And I always wondered whether that wasn't, you know, chemically enhanced. In, uh, I, and so we, three years ago now, we basically drove around all the garden centres um, uh, nearby in East Sussex. Big names, you know, places like B&Q and Home Base and Y Vale and so on. And we bought, we specifically bought the bee friendly plants, the ones that they, you know, which are often labelled with a little logo of a bumblebee or whatever, or they use the RHS Perfect for Pollinator logo. And we took them back to the lab and we screened them to see what pesticides were were in them, in the pollen and in the nectar. Um, and basically virtually all of them had pesticides in them. 75% uh, of them had insecticides in them, which clearly, you know, if you're buying those plants as being perfect for pollinators, you don't want them to be full of insecticides. And I, I think it is pretty scandalous that this, you know, continues. 70% um, of them contained things called neonicotinoid insecticides, which are um, kind of have become notorious. Uh, for their uh, toxicity to bees, you know, they're incredible. I could tell you much more about them, but probably don't want the detail now. But um, basically, they're, they're, they're minuscule amounts of them will kill a bee. And yeah, yeah, it's, I was kind of depressing, really. But um, people should be aware of this. You know, if you want to make your garden into a kind of haven for wildlife, then beware. Don't buy your plants from these the garden centre, grow them from seed, plant swap with friends and neighbours, find an organic nursery online or locally if you're lucky. They do exist. Um, rosy bees, if you Google it, and I don't get a share, so it's I've no vested interest, but they peat free, organic, bee friendly plants, available mail order. So um, yeah, it, but it, I mean, it strikes me that something should be done about this. You know, the companies shouldn't be allowed to sell plants as bee friendly if they're full of pesticides. And it's high time actually to be more positive. There's a great marketing opportunity. If there's anyone listening who, who works for, you know, one of the one of the big chain garden centers, why not have a proper pesticide free bee friendly range? You know, I think they'd clean up if anyone actually offered that. Um, yeah. And it can't be impossible to do. Yeah, and it, has, I mean, it has to be said, I'm hoping it has to be said, that I'm right, that there, you've mentioned organic ones. And I'm sure there are sort of garden centres out there that don't use pesticides, uh, some of the smaller independents. Um, certainly something I'm going to be asking when I go out and, and sort of buy plants in the future. I think definitely it merits um, us doing an interview on that at some stage and just sort of broadening on sort of pollinators, more about their importance, more about what is actually causing a threat to them. Um, what I'd like to sort of move on to now 
given that people are sort of stuck at home, is um, something that they can do from home. I'd like just to talk to you about your charity, the Buzz Club, uh, that you've introduced. Uh, so if you can give us a little bit of background to that. Now, I've found a fantastic project on there that I think is going to be great for sort of kids and families to, to do. Um, but if we start off just by talking about Buzz Club and where that came from. Yeah, so the Buzz Club is a very kind of informal um, organisation which is trying to get as many people as possible involved in helping us uh, do little experiments in, in our gardens um, and if we can get enough people involved actually we've got it's like a whole team of researchers around the country we, and we're trying to find out primarily what things um, work best that people might do in their garden to encourage wildlife. Uh, you know there's lots of advice out there but it's not always based on good science or good evidence you know sometimes it's just kind of guesswork and people are making it up um, so we want to test things and we want to get people involved enlist the help of, of as many people as we can around the country so it kind of gives us scientific evidence base to support recommendations about how to make your garden wildlife friendly and at the same time it's just a fun way of uh, engaging people you know getting them to 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 do little projects and see what happens and and encouraging them to look at you know these small creatures buzzing around in their gardens which most of the time we're too busy aren't we i mean and now you know suddenly many of us are not quite as busy as we were it's the perfect time to get people out in their gardens trying to make them be friendly or just looking at uh, the creatures out there and learning to appreciate them a little bit because they're really cool and fascinating and they're all around us you know i have this kind of crazy optimistic vision that if we could get everyone in, in, engaged with this and you know there, there are about half a million hectares of gardens in the UK um, imagine if they were all full of you know insect friendly flowers and no pesticides and all you know lots of other little things that you can do um, to make your garden more insect friendly then you know that's like a vast network of nature reserves and uh, uh, it's actually a bigger area than all of our nature reserves put together um, uh, I think that would be really cool and uh, so yeah that's and, and what better time to, to do it than while we're all twiddling our thumbs waiting for the lockdown to end. Yeah too right so yeah let's start the campaign tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. So what, one project I've got to talk about this project because it looks really fascinating I'm going to try and hold it up here and, and sort of <laughs> give a bit of an idea I don't know if, if you can see that then hopefully everybody else I can, can see it so I guess that means that everyone else can hoverfly lagoons hoverfly lagoon yeah that I mean come on that that sounds brilliant in itself but do you want to give us a little bit of a background of that I'm going to send people there via a link uh, I think, you know, families getting involved in that is going to be great, unless I pick the wrong time of the year, of course. But... No, no, no. Actually, any time is good for hoverfly lagoons. They sound rather, rather, um, uh, rather good, don't they? Rather attractive. I can sort of imagine sunbathing next to one, but uh, they're, they're not as attractive in reality as all that to look at. But they're really in so they were invented by Ellie Rotheray, who uh, did a PhD with me on hoverflies, and she's a kind of hoverfly specialist. Still, she's at Sussex Uni still. Um, now, what many people don't realise is that some hoverflies, um, which is, as adults are beautiful insects and important pollinators, but their larvae are aquatic. They live in small puddles, um, sometimes called rot holes, um, which are basically places usually in, in big old trees, perhaps imagine a sort of slowly dying ancient oak tree where it has cracks and, and uh, forks where water collects and leaves collect and they start to rot and that's the exactly what the perfect breeding habitat for some species of hoverfly so the female fly is attracted by the smell of rotting organic material and lays her eggs nice. which hatch into these weird maggots with long tails which Ellie calls long-tailed larvae but which traditionally in in British people have called rat-tailed maggots which is doesn't make them sound great but they're actually really fascinating the tail is a breathing tube a snorkel um anyway you the, the rot holes aren't very common these days because we don't we the countryside is too tidy um there aren't many of these big old decaying trees around with rot holes in them but you can make your own rot hole in your garden really easily um i mean ellie's shown that it works just just get a uh, a big plastic milk carton and chop the top off fill it with water ideally rainwater but tap water will do and then a handful of organic material lawn clippings leaves anything really 
chuck it in. And literally within two or three days, if you're lucky, you'll get the first female hoverflies coming and sniffing it out and laying their eggs. And uh, so it's a, it's a fun thing to try. Now, it's a fairly new invention. Nelly came up with this two or three years ago. And we want to find out, you know, what works best, which kind of organic materials work best. So you can try different, you know, different uh, leaves from different plants or grass or whatever you've got available um, and different sizes of containers and just try it out. Um, so there's full instructions available on the on the Buzz Club website and you can send in your results to, they go straight to Ellie if you uh, take the time to, so we ask you to then count how many larvae you find in your lagoon. You can make more than one, you can have dozens of them if you want to get carried away. Um, and it'll help us work out, you know, d perhaps different species of hoverfly are attracted to different types of material. We don't know at this stage, so we're trying to find out. Um, but it's a fun project. It doesn't take very long. It doesn't require you to buy any materials. You can make them with whatever you can find lying around. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's both helping kind of science build the evidence base for uh, how, what we can do in our gardens. And it's, it's just fun you know these are I mean, rat-tailed maggots they don't sound great but they're actually really cool fascinating my kids love digging around with I was the say, they might not sound great to adults but to kids i bet they sound fantastic and they certainly yeah. sound fantastic to me um right well i think we'll leave it there dave I, I definitely think we need to do another one and i'll be in touch with you about that and we'll we'll talk about these sort of chemicals um i know that she books out in paperback i've got a plug i mean if jonathan ross can do it and so, so can I. Got to plug the book. <laughs> They're fantastic books. Honestly, if you haven't read one of Dave's books, you need to read them. They are brilliant books. Thank so you. I think what I'll do is I'll leave you to your apple trees. I'm not going to say what that means because they're going to have to read the book and then they'll find out. So I'll leave you to your apple trees. Thank you ever so much for your time. And <laughs> I hope to speak to you again soon. Yeah, that'd be great. That's Take great. care. Thanks very much. Cheers, Dave.